Energizing brands for modern China. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. The global financial crisis and the rise of digital media have forced advertisers to reevaluate the way they build brands and interact with their customers. But China's size, growth, and chaotic media market make it difficult for advertisers to anticipate new customer demands. Today, our experts will look at how to energize your brand in China. And our own PT Black will have a thought or two on how some of China's own local leading brands have led the way. But first, we'll speak with John Gershma, best-selling author and planner at YNR. John, you believe that virtues like thrift and hard work are back in fashion. Is this a trend that only applies to the U.S., or do you see it in emerging markets as well? I think it's a big global trend. I mean, one of the things that we saw were that people were actually supporting brands that reinforced their values, things like self-reliance, community, hard work, empathy. These have become more important sort of underpinnings for the reasons why we buy brands today. And did you see these types of trends before the rise of companies like Groupon and, and things like that, or did they go hand in hand? They kind of went hand in hand, and a lot of these values, when we use the word values, it sounds sort of conservative versus liberal. It was really things that were about common sense, right? So self-reliance, community, authenticity, you know, trust, those were really important things. And we actually interviewed Andrew Mason for the book before... Um, you know, um, Google offered him $6 billion for his business. Right. But I mean, these brands that are starting to emerge in this framework are really interesting, and a lot of them have a lot of resonance. Are there any Chinese brands right now that are operating overseas that you see making an impact in Western markets? Yeah, I mean, clearly they've become much more of a staple. There's greater awareness, brands like Hire, um, you know, clearly Baidu, and, and what it's done to sort of overcome um, Google, for example. I mean, there's definitely some, a lot of excitement in this marketplace. But I actually think the more exciting thing is the number of brands that we don't know about that are here. And, you know, as these start to roll out, you know, the excitement that they can come into the marketplace and sort of take on existing um, categories and really challenge them. Do you feel like with the now the rush of all the social media um, and the trends that you're seeing in those areas, do you sometimes have to calm your clients down and say, listen, you don't necessarily need a Twitter page or <laughs> you know, everyone's jumping on in China, it's Weibo. Yeah, you know, sure. Does everybody need all of these social tools? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about Trevor is like, don't think about the idea, the gadget, you know, social media or social marketing, all those buzzwords. Actually think about your company as social as business model. So one of the, the companies we interviewed for the book, a very big company in the U.S. called Ford, Scott Monty is head of social media there, and he created a program called the Ford Fiesta Movement. And what he did is he wanted to have people test drive the car. And what he discovered is when they were test driving it, largely millennials complained about the cup holders. And the reason was they were taking fast turns and their Red Bulls were flying out of the cup holders that were designed for sort of Cokes and Pepsis. Hmm. And his point about it was, you know what, he got R&D and engineering involved and they made a real-time solution. So it's really about social as business model, not necessarily putting up a, a, a Facebook page or a Twitter page or a Weibo page. It's like basically making commitments that you're going to be social to your customer. What do you think about the possibilities of China ever having a luxury brand like a Chinese LV? Oh, I think it's absolutely possible. I mean, this is a huge luxury market. Um, there's tremendous opportunity for craftsmanship, for creating um, amazing brands all over the world. And I think so much of the luxury dominance has been sort of trapped in sort of three countries and it needs to really be, um, be opened up and expanded. And that's really what this time is about today. And do you think, you know, foreign consumers, foreign as in foreign to the Chinese, US, Europe, would ever accept a Chinese luxury brand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if you just look at provenance and where things come from, I think we have a growing appetite and interest um, you know, in all types of brands. I think part of the idea and excitement is just getting those brands out in the marketplace so that people can really grab a hold of them and, and understand what they're all about. Do you see any ways that China could potentially be stronger or bring some lessons to the West? Oh, absolutely, in so many different ways. I mean, the sense of optimism right now and the sort of endless possibilities is something that's, I think, hugely infectious and inspiring. Uh, to people in the West. I mean, we've gone through this period of sort of up and down and certain economy. Consumer confidence has been sort of back and forth. And so I think that the confidence and the excitement that you feel just being in Shanghai is something that is clearly needed in, in the more developed markets. Great. Well, thanks a lot, John. Thanks, Trevor. And here's P.T. Black with a thought or two about the success behind China's leading brands. Finding your way through China's world of brands can be difficult. 
demographics, psychographics, cultural differences, regulatory differences. It's easy to get lost. So I'm going to give you a couple of pointers to how to navigate this. The first rule is that China is more crowded. Hard as it is to believe, in almost every industry and vertical, there are more options in a Chinese shelf than their counterparts in the West. We have more brands of convenience stores, each selling a wider range of potato chip. In an environment with so many options, awareness and standing out is already a big accomplishment. It's a jungle. And greater selection means more than just a range of options. It also means a range of vertical options. That is, options in pricing, high and low, and also in quality. In other countries, you can assume that anything you buy has a certain minimum standard of safety. That's not necessarily the case in China. So being big for a brand is more than just about awareness. It also brings with it a certain guarantee of security. Third, brands have had less time to establish themselves. What's more, this process is happening at different speeds in different city tiers. So it's a very difficult trick keeping your current consumers while introducing yourself to new consumers. Thanks, PT. With me now is R3 partner Greg Paul, Charles de Brabant, CEO at St. Pierre Brabant Lee & Associates, and Jean Lin, Isobar CEO, Asia Pacific. John Gershma says virtues like thrift are back in fashion in the West. Are the Chinese following these trends? I mean, what virtues appeal to Chinese consumers? Well, I think you've seen a lot of diversification now, but still Chinese are very, very status driven. Uh, you look at the luxury brands here, they didn't really have a downturn the way it was in the West. So you've still seen a lot of growth in the luxury sector here, and you're going to see that for some time to come. Right. And, but here, social media has also recently taken uh, a huge uh, increase in terms of its popularity and use by brands. So Gene, in terms of social media, it allows brands to reach a lot more consumers, yeah. but it also makes it more difficult for them to control mm -hmm. and to protect their brand equity. Mm -hmm. So how do companies use social media in a way that helps them grow the brand, but also protect its integrity? I think one key thing that marketers need to realize today is that um, you really cannot control the consumer. What you can do is to respect them and embrace what you need to do best, that is delivering your product and offering. So once you actually have that principle, you don't need to control what the consumers think, but to participate in the conversation to ensure that they know you and your brand better. I right. think that's the, the most important principle in terms of doing social marketing. And Charles, uh, I, I in, in luxury, I mean, yeah, uh, this well, is in, your luxury, in, luxury, in luxury, it's a little bit complicated because yeah. you want to keep the aspira aspirationality of your brand. So if you're Chanel, you want to, in my view, you want to control um, right. because you want to keep that aspirational part of the brand, which how? is a little bit complicated. How, how do you control well, it? Well, one of the things that Chanel does extremely well in the digital world is it actually, once you click onto Chanel anywhere in the web, it brings you back to Chanel News, which is an environment that they completely control. So that, that, that's one brand, and I think Chanel, because of its positioning, needs to do that. But a brand like Burberry, um, which is I wouldn't, a more democratic brand, but I wouldn't say that in a, uh, in a derogatory way. Um, but just because of the way that uh, uh, Christopher Bailey, the creative director, talks to people and the brand positioning allows them to have a much more fluid two-way communication with consumers and engage the consumer. And I think that today in the luxury world, even the same consumer, sometimes they want to aspire, sometimes they want to talk. So there's place for, for brands to do both things. But if I were Chanel, I wouldn't start interacting two-way all the time with consumers because that's not, what they're that's not what consumers are looking for from a brand like Chanel. Right, and that makes sense if you're controlling your own corporate communications and things like that. But within China, I mean, if you look at the advent of platforms like Weibo, how do luxury brands control those sort of channels of communication? You, you, you don't necessarily control them, but you monitor them. For instance, L'Oreal did a lot of monitoring after the SK2 crisis, um, which one, they started it because of crisis management. So they wanted to monitor words and see if there was a crisis emerging. But they then realized that it was a phenomenal tool to understand what was happening on the web and what consumers were saying, mm. which is one of the reasons I think that within the L'Oreal group, Lancôme is the number one digital brand uh, on the web today because they used all that information extremely intelligently to create a community of people. And Lancôme can interact like this because it, it has an emotional platform that allows it as a brand to, to communicate that way. Right. So you're saying in some ways to preserve for some, you know, perhaps at the highest end of the luxury spectrum, 
some of those brands actually need to maintain a bit of that mysticism and a bit of that distance. Mm -hmm to preserve the aspirational aspect, perhaps. Which is a big challenge, given what we know today and the fact that you can't control the net citizens out there. Right. But I think brands have to be careful. They can't betray who they are and what consumers are expecting out of them. Could you talk about Weibo? We've just done some interesting research to show that three of the top four brands that we've seen in terms of consumer engagement are the sports brands, Nike, Adidas, and Li Ning. Mm -hmm. So they're already very high engagement brands. They're in a very high engagement category and they're already using social media in a very compelling way. So it's going to be interesting to see what we can learn from them that you can take to some of the other brands in China. It's interesting that you've got Li Ning in there now with the, uh, the sure. big boys like Nike. Yeah. And actually, that, that dovetails very well into the, the next issue that I'm very concerned about, which is what Chinese brands do you think have the greatest chance of playing on the global stage? Well, you know, Li Ning will be one of them. I think it's changed a lot in the last five years. There's been more changes in the last five years than probably the previous 20 years for Chinese brands. They've attracted great talent from P&G and Coca-Cola and, and other companies. They're really raising their game quite a lot. You know, Li Ning, Lenovo, Yili, some of these companies are now very much looking outward, uh, much more than ever before. Can you think of any examples of Chinese brands who have done a good job creating a luxury image? I think since brand building is relatively a new thing in China compared to the West, I think a lot of brand development is still in this space trying to figure out a way to to have the real brand equity build up that suits Chinese people. So a short answer to this is I've not yet seen a successful luxury Chinese brand in the market. I don't know what the gentlemen think well, about you it. You know, I think one of the interesting things you'll see is, uh, you know, LVMH has recently bought a couple of uh, Baiju brands, right, and try mm -hmm. to reinvent mm -hmm. the, the Chinese wine uh, brands. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you may see that where foreign, uh, foreign brands come in to try and reinvigorate in that sector. And so talking about, you know, consumers and the control of the relationship between consumers and brands, obviously in the West uh, for quite a while already, consumers have been quite used to driving the conversation and really sometimes driving the interaction more so than here. But I mean, here we can see a tide shift as well. Have you seen examples where consumers are actually taking charge of the relationship between themselves and brands? Well, I think, you know, Consumer Day, which is every year at the same time, is a very intense day for most companies because on that day, there are three or four brands announced that consumers have voted as being not of a high enough quality. Uh, you know, HP last year, lost a lot of market share just purely based on consumer day. So, uh, you know, consumers do have a voice in, in certain areas in China. And I think because of the, the rise of Chinese Weibo, it's actually mm. a good channel for Chinese people actually to voice out what they think of the brand and how they feel. So th that, that's something that the listening and monitoring of social media actually come into play. The, the way that a brand embrace consumer may not necessarily be interacting with them you know, uh, energetically, but in a way is to embrace and listening to what they have to say and make sure that we deliver the service in the right way. Yeah, there's now 191 million uh, Chinese social media users. It's more than the entire inter internet population in the United States. So, and that's only going to continue to grow. Which, which means the monitoring is not so easy because that's where they're expressing themselves. So you got you got to build up relatively yep. sophisticated ways to monitor because that's where it's happening. Have you guys seen some good examples where brands that perhaps were previously uh, a bit traditional or a bit stodgy have reinvented themselves or reinvigorated themselves in China? Uh, can you give us some real examples? I think there are actually a lot of brands that are doing it. And I can think of like two examples. One is a brand like KFC, which is dominating mm. the fast food chain in China that they actually quite li actively listening to the conversation on Weibo regarding their product, their new, new services, and consumers' reaction to their sales promotions. Mm. And that you have seen actions being taken for the way that adjust their sales promotion in the stores. And the other thing that's quite um, interesting last year is the, the, the sale of um, the smart car on Taobao. So basically, it's a social program that use one bot on Weibo to start the entire selling proposition, have a group on, on Taobao, yeah. and sold 205 cars in only three and a half hours. So that's an amazing example of how social actually becomes social commerce. And I think that's a key thing that's going to happen in this convergent world here in China, combining commerce and social together. Great. Greg, Charles, Jean, thanks a lot for joining us on Thoughtful China. That wraps it up for today. Please subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube, and you can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter. Hey.